Now, now, this is, uh, just so you know, August uh, 1st was the day when our new board of directors officially, according to our bylaws, took, took their seats at the table, um, which means that Gail Bear, who's going to do announcements in a few moments, um, this is her second day of not being the immediate past president right. of the congregation. <laughs> that means two things. Number one is she is completely off the hook. Susan Sendro, uh, uh, who else do we have here? Is Fran or Larry here? Some of our other past presidents here tonight? I can't see. Susan Sendro will tell you what a great feeling that is. Now the real work begins, Gail, for oh. the synagogue. Okay. Yes. <laughs> now it's like grandchildren. You get to do the work, and then you get to leave whenever you want. But thank you for years and years and years of service to our synagogue and Mazel Tov on the completion of that cycle. Speaking of leadership, one of the things that we learn from segue attempt from uh, our Parsha this week has a lot to do with leadership because Moses, like Gail, has some ambivalence about ending his term in office. Gail gets to see the fruits of her labor in the coming years. Moses does not. Uh, really, at the end of this week's Parsha, the very last word of this Parsha, which is a double Torah portion, which ends the book of Numbers. It is called uh, Matot Maaseh. What's the last word of the book of Numbers? Does anyone know? Trivial pursuit. The last word of the book of Numbers. <laughs> it should have been Amen. Anyone? Jericho. So at the end of this week's Parsha, Moses goes up the steps of Moab and is looking over the Dead Sea and to Jericho. And so the topic of the entire book of Deuteronomy is when you enter the land, don't mess it up. That's, a, that's it. That's the, we can skip Deuteronomy. I just told you Deuteronomy in one sentence, which is very unrabbinic. But yes, this, this week's Parsha, the double Parsha, is, 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 is confusing, concerning, and violent. There are lots of other good parts uh, in the Parsha. But let me, let me do a little bit of a connection and correlation from what I'm talking about. Because if we learn anything from Jewish life, it's that there are limits, just like there was for Moses, to power. There are limits to human power, limits to, even if we are really strong as a nation, limits to what it is that we can and can't do. Judaism's constant reminder, constant reminder, Zecher Yitziat Mitzrayim, remember, you were nothing. You were slaves. You had no rights. You were dirt in the land of Egypt. And we learn that as the calling card of almost everything we do. There is no Shabbat service where we don't say, Zechariah Yitziat Mitzrayim, remember you, the exodus from Egypt, that you were slaves, because God wanted us to have power. God wanted us to have great power. But there are limits to the power. What do I mean? Well, in the first parsha, Matot, let me tell you, it says the following, and it's not very good if you're a Midianite. Now, if you'll remember earlier from Numbers, the Midianites were very problematic. They enticed the Israelites to worship Baal, or what's called here Baal Peor, which means the Baal, the god Baal at a place called Peor. And, that was, and they were tempted to worship Baal Peor because the worshipers, the Baal Peorites, or the people who worship Baal at Peor, um, this worship, this religion was very idolatrous and very enticing because it was filled with sexuality. And so God wants to do the following and says to Moses and Matot the following, carry out the vengeance of the children of Israel against the Midianites. Afterwards, you shall be gathered to your people. Moses is told, go and get an army together. We're going to attack the Midianites. We're going to see what that looks like in a second. And then you can start to wind down. You can retire. It's like that old... I, I, you can retire. It's like the, in those mob movies, right? You can retire, but I have one more thing that I need you to do, take care of. Go whack all of the Midianites. <laughs> then you can be gathered to your people. And it says in the Torah, they killed every male for worshiping Baal Peor, that god, that idol. Um, those, if you remember that line 
in Genesis, God really meant it. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Not good to be a Midianite. Because the Midianites enticed him to worship Baal, took these poor slaves who were still very confused and ambivalent about what it meant to be a free people. And God schmices, has the Israelites schmice, which is Yiddish for whacked, all of the males. Now, lest you think we're really violent in the book of Numbers toward the end, in comes Maaseh, the last parsha. And there are five utterances, five things that God then also adds to the list for Moses, sort of a laundry list of things to do, and that is as follows. Number one, dispossess all the inhabitants of the land and destroy all of the other idols, which means when you go into Canaan, you're going to dispossess the people, which is a nice way of saying kill the people, and you are going to destroy all of their idols. There are boundaries that are made in Maaseh. God actually tells Moses, this is the northern boundary, this is the southern boundary of Israel, this is the eastern and the western boundaries of Israel. That's part of the whole, you can see it, but you can't go in. There is uh, tribal representatives are, are told how they're going to divide up the land, right? If you have Judah with 65,000, then you're going to get this portion. And if you're Asher with 20-something thousand, you're going to get this portion. There's the commandment to set aside cities for the tribe of Levi because they don't get their own land. Um, they get a regular portion of the land, but there's a place for them at least to live. So it's good and bad to be a Levite. You don't have land ownership, but you're working for God at the temple, so that's not so bad. And then the cities of refuge, if you remember those, those are the cities that are set up for people, um, unintentional murderers of people. If someone killed someone by mistake, they would go to a city of refuge so that family members of aforementioned killed person wouldn't go kill them. So let's talk about this idea of conquest because it fits in with power. Power and conquest are what these parshas are about. One, kill all the Midianites. Two, dispossess the people of the land and destroy all the idols. It's sort of violent, and it makes a lot of us very uncomfortable when we read Torah. But I want to hopefully say two things that will make us, I don't care if it makes you feel better. I care. I'm indifferent to whether it makes you feel better, meaning I want the Torah to speak for itself. Because if we can't live with ambiguities, if we can't tolerate that Judaism, the Torah has got some pretty violent sections in it, with what the ultimate message of these violent sections is, we're going to have a tough time being Jewish. So I want to help with that, hopefully facilitate that. So first of all, Moses is told specifically, dispossess the land, and, or to have Joshua and all the people dispossess the land and ruin, uh, destroy all the, all the, um, all the idols. Um, at first glance, as I said, it seems pretty violent. So let's see what it says regarding, because what they're going to do is they're going to murder a lot of people, but let's, 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 it, that's what they're going to do, but let's talk about that for a second. So along with these uh, admonitions, these instructions to go conquer the land, God also says the following, you shall not pollute the land in which you are, because blood is that which pollutes the land. And the land will not be atoned for the blood that is spilled in, in it, except by the blood of the people who spilled it. So do not defile the land which you settle, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, Adonai, dwell in the midst of the children of Israel. God is saying, go dispossess the land, murder the Midianites before you get in, and then says, don't pollute the land. You will pollute the land by spilling blood. What does that mean? That sounds like two completely different ideas. One is, you have my permission to go kill these people, but the second is, don't pollute the land. The blood, especially blood that is spewn in the land of Israel, God's land, pollutes the land, pollutes God, pollutes the whole idea. What are these two premises teaching us that are, talk about tolerating ambiguities. What are they teaching us? What do you think they're teaching us? On the one hand, and on the other hand, yes, Sally. This is going to be the group participation section. Well, not to be too savage, I guess. Not to be too savage. When, you, when, you, when you're at war, you have lots of choices that you can make, and human emotion takes over. And when you're on the attack or you're defending, um, you know, 
you can, you can get pretty savage as human beings. Don't get too savage. I like that a lot. Yeah. Well, there, what do you mean there's always two sides? Because God has already made, took, took sides on the one hand. You can go dispossess and destroy. But on the other hand, saying don't pollute with blood. So tell me what you meant. Preservation, yes. So you've got this idea of murder and destroying idols, right? Because the Canaanites, these were not great people, P.S. We're going to learn a lot in Deuteronomy. Don't be like the Canaanites. They were savages themselves, right? They were idol worships. They were, it was like Vegas. <laughs> it was sin city, but sin country. I mean, it was not a good place. Deuteronomy will tell us that. So there's a way to go about doing it. Look at both sides, but also look at their human beings involved on both sides. Yes, maybe. What else? Yeah. Uh, reading ahead. You, <laughs> reading ahead. <laughs> Joshua was um, he was tough. God knew what God was doing when Joshua got the assignment. Yes. Joshua was a warrior. That's a nice way of putting it. Well, but was Joshua an evil person because Joshua was so tough in enacting this? He followed the instructions to the letter. So it's interesting that you said that, though, because it's almost as if the implication of that is God did not want Moses to do this. God didn't want Moses to be directly involved in giving the command to go forward and possess the land. That was part of the maybe mixed blessing of Moses not being able to. Any others? Any other ideas about this paradox? Yes. If God created everybody on earth, why did he want to destroy some? Okay, that's a different question. The question is, if God created everyone on earth, why would God want to destroy certain people? And it goes really to a question of human suffering, of war, of spilling of blood of all kinds. But Sam, that's a, that's a different topic. Because that has to do with human suffering. And that has to do with why certain people are designated as enemies and certain are not. By the way, the quick answer is everyone is created in the image of God. Everyone has a godliness within them. Some people choose not to live or activate or use that godliness, what I call that nudge inside of them that says do the right thing, make the right choices, act the right way. And to go, as it were, off, off, the, off the map, and they become evil. So in, in the Torah's interpretation, these were evil people who needed to be... By the way, there's a whole other question here is, is the best way to take care of evil the way that you take care of cancer, which is to kill all of it? And that's a whole other question about war. And that's a good segue to taking over. So I can't, it's not a great answer because it's a long answer, but it is really troublesome to have a God who says, go kill everyone. It's very troublesome, Sam. Yeah. There are times over the centuries, over the millennia, when we have to kill mm -hmm. a lot of people to survive. Yes. And so if it wasn't in there, it wouldn't be a realistic representation of the, 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 the statement is very clear that there are certain times that we have had to utilize our power, utilize force, become forceful in order to save ourselves. Israel does it all the time and has done it throughout its history all the time to protect itself. But is there a limit to that? Again, we're going into a different topic, but is there a limit? And maybe that's where the second verse comes in, going back to just full circle to what Sally said, which is, yes, but... Or and, I should say. Forget about but. Yes, and don't become animals while you're doing it. That will violate my land. That, that's not the kind of blood I want spilled. There was one more thing, Jeff? And then i got to wrap it up. Sure, sure. If you're a fundamentalist, crazy on the 
ISIS-like Muslim, you're told to do basically the same concept, which is rid the world of the non-believers, rid the world of the people who don't do what I tell you to do. It's divinely mandated, right? By the way, if you can't understand that mindset, you can't beat them. Whether it's a fanatic, a fundamentalist Islamic fanatic in Iran or Syria, or it's a fundamentalist fanatic in Arizona. You have to understand the mindset of someone who looks at the world so entirely through a lens of, if you don't do it the way that my God says to do it, you should be put to death. And it feels like there are more and more people who, who are believing that, you know, whether it's verbally assassinate or character assassinate or actually kill. So yes, that is the mindset. Um, and it's biblical, and it's in the Quran, and it's in, it's in the um, New Testament. It's definitely in the teachings of the church fathers, you know, as justification for the Holocaust leading all the way up to Pope Pius XII, who his, his hands were clean of that. That was good for Christianity, what Hitler was doing. That's why they were buddies. So it's a very dangerous, troubling concept. Let me bring it back full circle to this week's Parsha. Because it goes to what Sally said at the beginning. God is basically saying that this law, this idea, the second part, that you can't pollute the land with the blood, that blood pollutes the land, that war is necessary but not good. I want you to think about that idea. War is necessary, but not good. There are times when murder is doing the wrong thing, but for the right reason. But it's still not good. It's still the wrong thing, right? It's still wrong. But God is saying there are limitations. And the rabbis teach Nehmanides, who we'll learn about when we go to Spain next March, teaches, because that's where he's from, that these laws apply everywhere. They are even more severe in the land of Israel because of God's presence there. All human life, think about how crazy this is. God is telling them to go to war and to destroy these people. And at the same time, uh, Ramban is saying, all human life still has to be cherished because all human beings are created in the image of God, like Sam was saying. Or like I was saying, but that Sam was saying. Murder is still deplorable in any society, and respect for human life must be the basis of a system of any morality and ethics. But if innocent blood is spilled, don't kill innocent people. There should be no such thing, right, as innocents being killed with the wicked. There should be no, um, what's it called? Um, co collateral damage. Collateral damage is not okay when you're sending drones, right? It's not okay. It's unethical. It's unethical. That's my problem with drones, you got a guy with a joystick somewhere 10,000 miles away, and innocent people are getting killed. Very bad, the Torah says. Innocent blood is spilled in the land of Israel. It desecrates. Innocent blood desecrates the whole proposition. This goes to nature, to the environment. This goes to treatment of animals. Um, Bal Tsari Chaim, the idea of when you go to war, don't harm the trees and don't harm the doggies and the kitties. Right? You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to destroy natural resources, animals. They can't defend themselves. Once human beings, basically we're learning, have powers, have our most animalistic powers, God is teaching you have also dominion over life. So there have to be very strict boundaries. There are two types of war in Jewish law in the Mishnah. One is called the obligatory war. And one is called the voluntary war. Now, we could go on for hours about which one is which, but in an obligatory war, God is saying you're going to have to kill people. You're obligated to defend principles, ideas, Torah, if you will. But don't act like animals. When a people who has known killing and victimhood, like the Jewish people, we also have to be always conscientious of the value of human life, even in war, even when we're doing something destructive. And that when we know what that feels like, when we remind ourselves that power does not equal power over everything, does not mean that we become like God. 
that power can lead to the kind of corruption and the kind of toxicity that this part is talking to. This is 3,000 years ago, and they're brilliant. It's a brilliant idea. It's something for us to think about even today, as we discussed this evening. So that's something I'd like us to think about this Shabbat, what it means to have power and what it means to have limitations on power, what it means to go to war and what it means to go to just war, but what it means to not act like animals when you're in war, what it means that sometimes you have to do the wrong thing for the right reasons, but the right reason is ultimately what will enable us to not have to do the wrong thing anymore, pursuing the right thing. That's what it means to be Jewish, is to think about both, both sides. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Okay. I think I bit off a little bit more than I could chew, but the group participation was fabulous. And now I'm thinking we need to do a class in suffering. Sounds uplifting. It's always Sam that gives me the idea. Anyway...